If you remember messing up the marching minigame, sailing the tiny Bronco, and chasing Sephiroth all around the world, then you grew up playing Final Fantasy VII. But which one, the 1997 original or the 2024 Rebirth? Well, in this video, we're going to be comparing both games to highlight the similarities, differences, and changes between them. Now, this video is kind of a second part to my Final Fantasy VII comparison series, with the first video comparing the FF7 remake to the Midgar section of the original. And just like with that video, I will be going into full spoilers for the new game, but we'll only cover up until the end of the first disc of the original. There is a lot to cover, so let's get straight into it. In the original game, we pick the story up right after the party leave Midgar. They stop off in the town of Calm, where Cloud tells his friends about his past with Sephiroth. Five years ago, they arrived at Cloud and Tifa's hometown of Nibelheim to investigate a Marco reactor. And the cool thing about this section in the original is that you actually get to have Sephiroth in your party and see how powerful he is. After arriving, Cloud is free to explore the town for a bit. This includes breaking into Tifa's house and then stealing her underwear. The next morning, Tifa guides the party through the mountains to the Shinra reactor. Now, technically, Rebirth starts in Zack's reality, but that part of the story is rather fragmented and sort of follows its own plot, at least until the end, so we'll leave it for now. On the other hand, Rebirth's Nibelheim flashback sequence is very faithful to the original, at least at the start. Sephiroth is in the party, but you actually get to play as him this time. You can still go into Tifa's house and you will get this reaction when you open her drawer. You asshole! There is also a playable piano. Well shit, you're a merc of many talents. The new game also uses this section as a tutorial. Rebirth's battle mechanics are very similar to its predecessor. It's still an action RPG with a reworked materia and weapon system from the original. This game has also added some new traversal mechanics, with some of the playable characters having unique abilities that can be used throughout the journey. Now, in the original, Mount Nibble had a sinister feel to it which was used to foreshadow the dark events which were about to happen. Rebirth changes the atmosphere completely, infusing it with a sense of exploration and using it as the game's opening credit sequence. As you progress up the mountain, you realize that FF7 Remake's trademark expansion of existing locations is very much present in this game. The environments are much bigger and naturally more detailed. Unfortunately, Remake's tendency to add a bit of filler is also present here. I'm not really sure what using this big hoover to suck up the Marco gas has to do with the backstory. The rest of the flashback is very similar in both the original and Rebirth. Sephiroth discovers Genova, he then locks himself at the Shinra mansion to try and figure out the truth about his mother eventually going insane and burning down the town. At the reactor, Tifa tries to get revenge for her father, but is attacked by Sephiroth, who reunites with Genova. Cloud faces off against Sephiroth, but that's all he remembers. In the original, the party spend the night at the end before setting off again. But at this point, Rebirth stays with the characters, using this as an opportunity to introduce the relationship system spread across a dozen or so quiet moments throughout the game. Your interactions gain you points, which are then used to decide who you go on a date with at Gold Saucer. Now, this mechanic is present in the original, however, Rebirth makes it a lot more overt. The next morning, Cloud is able to explore Calm. The little town with eight buildings from the original has now been expanded into a much larger settlement in line with modern RPG standards. And I think this is one of Rebirth's big strengths. Every town, city, and settlement has been expanded. However, it's clear the developers took great care to keep key elements from the original for the old school fans. Each location is also filled with side quests that you can attend to, in addition to just random stuff you can run into, like these ladies dancing. Another the difference is that the party are actually chased out of town by Shinra who are still pursuing them. Now, the original game's locations were connected by an overworld like all Final Fantasy games of the 80s and 90s. But this being 2024, you can't have a single King Kong-sized sprite running around the world map. And so, FF7 Rebirth introduces its version of the open world map. And straight away you can tell this isn't going to be the type of game that tries to reinvent open world gaming. No, Rebirth's open world is simple and rather utilitarian. Sure, it has open worldy things like map towers and mounts that you can ride, but this game knows why you're here. You want to explore Junon, Gold Saucer, and Cosmo Canyon, and so it connects all these locations in a contemporary way. Now, the original game's world map was comprised of three main continents and then smaller land masses like the Wutai area. Rebirth's map layout is similar to the original 
original Bart does some creative tinkering to omit the locations the party won't be visiting in this section of the overall story. And when I say creative, I mean just slapping a big cloud over one third of the map. Or in Wutai's case, just leaving it on the other side of the globe. Areas like Midgar and Fort Condor are visible but aren't accessible. Midgar has Shinra soldiers blocking the road, and Fort Condor is blocked by these jagged rocks. And speaking of locations, at this point in the original you'd come to the swamp, which is impossible to cross because you always get attacked by the Midgar Zolo, so instead you have to catch a chocobo using the greens you bought from the farm, which can outrun the big snake. Rebirth follows the same formula, only this time there is a specific chocobo, Pico, that you have to sneak up on. And yes, there is an entire chocobo collecting element to this game, similar to the original. Also, whenever you ride a chocobo, the whole party gets one, and there is something incredible about seeing Red 13 ride on a chocobo, even if his head does clip through it. In the original, you have to outrun the snake, but in Rebirth, you actually have to take it on as a boss. Both games then have the party go through the mithril mine and then run into the Turks. Only Rebirth expands this section into an entire dungeon which takes up the best part of the chapter. The party exit the mines in the Junon region. At this point in the original, you can run into Yuffie, one of the two optional characters in the game. And your dialogue options dictate whether she joins the team or just steals all your stuff. The party then head for the village underneath Junon where they take on this big fish boss. This is followed by Cloud having to do this CPR minigame on Priscilla. In return for saving her, she calls her friend Mr. PS1 Dolphin to help you get up to Junon by doing this jumping minigame. Rebirth alters things a bit. Priscilla is still there, but Yuffie is the one who's in trouble. You save her and then fight the big fish. We then find out that Yuffie is on a mission to assassinate Rufus, but she doesn't join the party quite yet. You do get the Mr. Dolphin minigame, only this time it involves doing a race. In the original, Cloud gets to the top, disguises himself as a Shinra soldier, and then gets drafted into the parade, which is another minigame. And the quality of your performance is reflected in the TV ratings. This is followed by a synchronized send-off minigame for Rufus. The party then disguise themselves in Shinra uniforms and hop on board the boat, which takes them to the Western continent. The entire Junon sequence is a lot more grandiose in Rebirth thanks to the modern visuals. Aerith and Tifa also disguise themselves in soldier uniform and join Cloud for the parade. The sequence is still based around a button matching minigame, but this time Cloud is made captain and has to run around the city collecting units. After the performance, Cloud is brought before Rufus who tries to make a deal for them to assassinate Sephiroth, but Yuffie kind of blows it trying to assassinate him instead. Rebirth also has this subplot where Shinra and Wutai get ready for an all-out war. The Junon section ends with this ridiculous boss fight against the motorbike guy from the first game in an underground coliseum to the sounds of bebop jazz. In the original, the party crossed the ocean stowed away on the Shinra boat. There is a nice easter egg where you get to see Barrett dressed up in a little sailor's uniform and Red 13 disguised as a human soldier. In the new game, the boat is more of a cruise ship. And Remake also leans right into the Barrett and Red disguises. In fact, this time Red does an entire Michael Jackson routine to sneak into the Queen's Blood tournament held on board, which is a card battle minigame. That night, the ship is overrun by monsters which the party have to fight before Sephiroth shows up and unleashes the Genova monster. Now in the original, the party dock at Costa del Sol, which seems to be what the Japanese developers imagined a western beach town would look like. Ah, nothing like walking through water with your clothes still on. Rebirth expands Costa del Sol into a full-on beach resort with wheelies. The party engage in a bunch of different mini-games and side quests before hitting the beach, this time with a change of wardrobe. What a quirky little part of the game. Well, until Hojo shows up with groupies and then the good guys have to fight him still dressed in their beach. The chapter ends with the characters enjoying a nice sunset on the beach. Oh, and Yuffie does finally join the party and she even asks the same questions as in the original. Both games then have Cloud and friends cross Mount Corel and the Corel Reactor on the way to Gold Saucer. Naturally, Rebirth expands this section into a big dungeon, complete with loads of grappling, and then a minecart section at the end. Another difference is that the party actually spot a weapon in the ruins of the old reactor. Now, the weapons weren't really part of the game until the second disc. However, in this new timeline, the planet has awoken them to protect itself in the absence 
absence of the Arbiter of Faith. You know, that thing they killed at the end of the first one? Both games then set up Barrett's backstory and the tragic history of Corel. The party then head to Gold Saucer. In the original, you enter by paying a fee. We then meet Kate Sith, who joins the party. The fun doesn't last for long because Cloud and friends are quickly dropped into Corel prison after Barrett is mistaken for his old friend Dine, who shot up a bunch of Shinra soldiers. Rebirth turns the party's arrival at Gold Saucer into a very over-the-top, very Japanese event, complete with costume changes, spontaneous dance sequences, and an extremely roided-up Dio, who challenges Cloud to this nice boxing minigame using the sprites from the original. After that, the main story beats kind of play out the same, only there's no GP system this time, instead you've got to visit every area and play all the minigames. There is also a bit more of a setup to the date you're going to go on the second time you visit Gold Saucer, and eventually the party are made to go down to Corel Prison by Dio to find the culprit behind the shooting. In the original, the Corel Prison section is split into two main parts. First, we have the search for and encounter with Dine, and then a trip back to Gold Saucer to try and win back your freedom via a chocobo race. Rebirth switches these sections around. This time, Barrett has gone missing and Cloud has to do the chocobo race first in order to get information on his whereabouts. Well, before that, we've got to do a bit of filler in the form of having to find food for the chocobo. Oh, I didn't realize Panic of the Disco had a residency in Corel Prison. And so Cloud wins the race and then we find Barrett in the desert. And just like in the original, Barrett confronts Dine, but this time around Dine dies in a firefight with Shinra instead of, you know, just walking off the edge of a cliff. The sad moment is cut short by the arrival of Palmer in a big yellow robot which you have to fight. Both games then have the party obtain the buggy which is able to cross shallow water. Now in the original, you can either go straight to Cosmo Canyon or stop over at Gongaga. It's an optional town with another blown reactor where the party run into the Shinra goons and get some backstory about Zack. The remake makes Gongaga a mandatory location. After meeting Zack's parents, the party split in two and go to confront Scarlet and the Shinra forces at the reactor. Cloud and the boys take the normal route while Tifa and the ladies go via chocobos jumping on giant mushrooms. The plot then takes a bit of a left turn when Cloud, under Sephiroth's influence, attacks Tifa who falls into the Marco, then gets eaten by a weapon and then ends up in the live stream. She sees memories from her past and visions of Sephiroth corrupting Cloud before being spat out by the weapon. Yeah, I think we should have just gone straight to Cosmo Canyon. Speaking of which, the original version of Cosmo Canyon is accessible by foot on the world map. There we meet Red's grandpa, Bugenhagen, who gives us a nice environmental presentation about how sucking out all the planet's life force is a bad idea. Cloud then has a nice moment with his crew by the bonfire, before going through the cave of the Gi where they defeat the evil ghost and learn that Red's father Seto was a hero that sacrificed himself. In Rebirth, Cosmo Canyon can only be reached by air or boat, and so the party get a lift from none other than Sid Highwind and his tiny Bronco. That's right, the same Sid that you won't actually meet until a bit later in the original. The game makes you think that you have some marginal control over the Bronco when it flies, but in reality it's on rails. Upon arrival at Cosmo Canyon, Red 13 reveals that he's been putting on a voice and he actually sounds like a 90s teenager from a Pepsi commercial. Hey guys, it's me! Get it? Because he's technically 16. Grandpa Oppenheimer is still floating on a big ball and he still gives a kick-ass presentation. But this time the entire town seems to be run by this planetology cult who sit in circles and clap at each other. Watch, any moment now they're gonna try to sell tea for some essential oils. The quiet moment by the campfire has also been turned into an entire festival. The Gi Cave has been expanded into an entire dungeon with different puzzles, but it still ends with the same boss fight and an emotional scene of Red learning the truth about his father. This time Time, however, the Gi Ghost shows up, takes the party on a gondola ride to his domain, and then asks them to retrieve the Black Materia. Now, the next part of the original has the party visit Nibelheim, which has now been rebuilt. They find Sephiroth in the basement of the mansion, who invites them to the reunion, and then bails. This is also the point at which you can unlock the second optional character, Vincent. You crack the safe, find the boss, and then get a key to his room where he's chilling in a coffin. Afterwards, the party cut through Mount Nibble and reach Rocket Town on the other side. Also, I I know they call it Mount Nebel now, but I'm too old to change. I can barely remember to call her Aerith. In Rebirth, Sid gives the party a lift to Nibelheim where we get some filler. You see, the party need to use a terminal in the Shinra mansion, but they can't access it without a keycard, which is all the way at the reactor. So they split in two. Cloud Tifa and Yuffie go through the mountains and up into the reactor. Kate Sith and the rest then go into the mansion only to get dropped into this basement section where you have to spend ages trying to get out by doing these boss 
box puzzles. The party does encounter Vincent at the end of the chapter, but this time you have to face him as a boss in his beast form before he joins the team. Now at this point in the original, the party meets Sid in Rocket Town, get his backstory, and then get in the tiny Bronco, which can only be used to sail around shallow waters due to a mechanical fault. This is also followed by the most confusing part of the original, where the game just kind of forgets to tell you where to find the keystone to get into the Temple of the Ancients until you stumble on this one little house where the guy tells you to go to Gold Saucer. In Rebirth, Kate Sif straight up tells everyone that the keystone is a Gold Saucer. Sid tries to fly the party there, but encounters a fault, thereby turning the Bronco into a boat. Also, at this point, both Sid and Vincent join the party in spirit. You see, they tag along for the story events, but you can't actually use them in battle. In the original game, you get the keystone from Dio after entertaining him at the battle station. The party then spend the night in a spooky hotel and Cloud goes on his date with either Aerith, Tifa, Yuffie, or Barrett, depending on the choices you made throughout the game. Cloud and his date participate in this little pantomime at Event Square, and then you get to ride the big wheel. This section ends with the party being betrayed by Kate Sith, who turns out to be a Shinra spy. Rebirth once again shuffles things around. The date actually takes place first, and the little pantomime has now been upscaled to a virtual reality performance of Loveless. It starts with an operatic ballet sequence featuring Jesse, before moving on to the reworked version of the play, this time around with Barrett and Red playing the bad guys. The button matching minigame is set alongside an elaborate action sequence, followed by a powerful vocal performance from Aerith. I'm still in a dream, snake eater. And now it's time for the most romantic part of the game, the wheel ride where you- Oh no, I've got the lads. Turns out if your relationship doesn't reach the threshold with any of the main characters, you go on a date with the rest of these lonely bastards. Damn, why do these developers have to hit so close to home? The next day you get the keystone from Dio, only this time you have to fight Don Corneo and his men who are trying to do a takeover of Gold Saucer. This is followed by a boss fight with the Turks and then another one with Rufus himself. Kate Ziv then betrays the team and steals the keystone. Stone. And so the party decide to follow him and Shinra to the Temple of the Ancients. Now the original Temple of the Ancients was comprised of this main maze area and then three puzzle sections, the rolling puzzle, the clock puzzle, and the door puzzle. The party finds Sephiroth who reveals his simple yet genius plan. Crash a giant meteor into the planet and then merge with it when it tries to heal itself thereby becoming God. Sometimes my genius is... It's almost frightening. But to do all that, he needs the black materia from the temple. The party take on the big red dragon and then this wall before reaching the black materia. Unfortunately, taking it will cause the temple to shrink back inside it, but Kate Sif shows up and sacrifices himself to let the others flee. This temple is the last big dungeon of rebirth, so naturally it's a long one. You're gonna spend a few hours doing these gravity puzzles, then these prayer puzzles, and also fighting a bunch of mini bosses. But the real question I have is who keeps stocking up these vending machines in the Temple. The party then come to the Room of Trials where you play through a vision of each character's darkest moment, which is heartbreaking, especially this bit where you have to play as little Aerith looking for help. And this is a prime example of the great job that Rebirth does at flashing out and developing each of the party members in the game. The rest of the Temple section is pretty close to the original. Sephiroth shows up, you have to fight the bosses, get the black materia, and then escape thanks to Kate Sift. But this is where things really start to diverge between the two games. In the original, the temple disappears, Sephiroth then shows up and makes Cloud give him the black materia, manipulating the Genova genes inside him. In the process, Cloud attacks Aerith and then blacks out. He then has a vision where Aerith tells him that she'll be at the City of the Ancients trying to save the planet from Sephiroth. Cloud and the party then dig up the Lunar Hop, which grants them access to the city. He reaches Aerith and is manipulated by Sephiroth to try and attack her, however Cloud resists thanks to his friends. Unfortunately, Sephiroth then swoops down and finishes the job himself himself. The party fight and defeat this Genova boss, Cloud then drops Aerith's body into the water in an emotional scene that concludes the first disc. Now the City of the Ancients section marks the end of Rebirth, and just like its predecessor, this game takes things in a different and rather complex direction at the end. Now I'm gonna do my best to summarize it, but to be honest, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. Sephiroth does manipulate Cloud to give him the black materia, but this time around he comes to his senses just in time to save Aerith from falling off these vines created by the Black Wisp 
whispers which are now controlled by Sephiroth. Cloud then blacks out just like in the original. At this point let's take a moment to finally talk about Zack who's been having these little interlude chapters throughout the game. Zack's story is set in an alternate reality and starts with him saving Aerith from Shinra. He takes her and his version of Sleepy Cloud to Elmira's house where they both recover while Zack, just like the player, tries to make sense of what the hell is going on. Zack runs into Biggs who's been sent there from the original reality and eventually dies. He then gets a premonition from Marlene that Sephiroth is going to kill Aerith and also learns that this version of the planet is out of Marco so the end of the world is imminent. Poor Zack, he got the shittest reality going. Okay, back to Cloud who wakes up in Zack's reality with Aerith or is this a third reality where the world is also ending? Anyway, they go on a date which ends at the church where Aerith gives Cloud her white materia and then sends him back so he could give it to his Aerith whose white materia has been depleted by the Whispers. Just like in the original, Cloud and the rest of the crew go looking for Aerith at the City of the Ancients, but this time it's been taken over by Sephiroth and his evil Whispers. Cloud then finds Aerith praying and overcomes the pull to the dark side by stopping Sephiroth. Oh my god, he's gonna s- oh no, she's still dead. From this point on, the multiverse tumble dry really gets the spin cycle going. You see, Sephiroth's new plan is to rule over every reality, that greedy bastard. Cloud and Zack's realities converge for a little bit and they get to fight Sephiroth together, but then he turns into this big pregnant Russian doll Sephiroth with a tiny Sephiroth on his head. This thing then fights Zack, Cloud and the rest of the party separately across multiple realities. Look, even the main characters are struggling to follow this. What in the hell is going on? And then finally Sephiroth takes on Cloud, this time with the help of Aerith. They defeat him and he flies away, for now. Aerith fades away but then she wakes up. Oh wait, they're actually gonna save her. Oh no 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 no, she's like a force ghost now that only Cloud can see and talk to. Oh and he also has the black materia now. And Wu Tai are gonna go to war with Shinra manipulated by Sephiroth. And Zack is still alive in his reality. I have absolutely no idea what's going on. And so there we have it, the original Final Fantasy VII compared to FF7 Rebirth. Wow, okay, so let's start with the straightforward stuff. Just like the remake, Rebirth expands both the world and characters of the original game and for the most part I think it did a really good job of both. The environments and locations have been brought up to contemporary standards while still retaining their connection to the original. Sure, they've lost a bit of that PlayStation 1 charm, but that was inevitable. Rebirth also excelled at flashing out the characters and giving them more time and opportunities to interact, which as a fan of the original I really appreciated. It's like seeing your favourite band from the 90s get back together only this time in 4K dressed in a bikini. There is still a bit of padding and filler in this game but it's a lot less jarring and better integrated than in the first instalment. And then we have the story changes, mainly those at the very end. Now, as of the making of this video, the game has only been out for about a week and the fandom seems to have already been split in two. There are those who herald this as a brilliant reinvention of the original and a bold step forward for the series. And then there are those who feel that the changes were unnecessary, out of place or just overly convoluted for the sake of it. Now personally, while I appreciate the developer's ambition and attempt at reinventing the narrative, I do think there are too many spinning plates in the air and we are getting to the point where you have to watch about three different explanation videos after completing the game just to understand what's going on. Just play along for a bit. Okay. But then again, Final Fantasy games have never really had straightforward stories, so maybe that's all part of it. But that's just my take. Please let me know your thoughts on how FF7 Rebirth compares to the original in the comments. Did you like the changes? What did you think of the ending? And where do you see it going in the final chapter? As always, thanks for watching. Please consider supporting me on Patreon and a big thanks to all my existing patrons. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and hit the bell. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.